Welcome to the Staying Free podcast. This podcast seeks to give a voice to real people around the world who are attempting to stay free, stay sovereign and stay sane in a world which is changing faster than ever. In this episode, I talk with Adam Brimson. Adam is an artist who's gained traction in the UK freedom movement through his politically charged artwork and commentary. We talk about everything from conspiracies and the COVID-19 global coup to artistic authenticity and challenging entrenched narratives through countercultural art. I hope you enjoy this conversation, and if you have any feedback or suggestions for interesting guests, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. A link is in the show notes. On to the episode. All right, Adam, thanks so much for coming on. I'm really looking forward to talking to you today. I love that you've already got the uh, V for Vendetta picture in the background so we're already setting ourselves up in the right direction do you want to just give a brief introduction uh, to yourself and uh, what you do yeah i'm adam brimson designs i'm an artist mainly painting but i do like illustrations some digital work and kind of maybe what more people know is i comment on kind of like things that are going on in the world right now yeah, so we kind of connected quite early on. I feel like we've been connected for quite a while um, since the early days of the kind of COVID-1984 era, um, yeah. which is kind of a strange thing. But um, I, I get the impression that both of us have developed uh, a much bigger following as a result of that. Um, so I guess let's start from the beginning of um, what was it you started to notice that you started tweeting about? Um, where was your kind of moment of feeling like it wasn't something quite right about everything going on in the world with regards to coronavirus so for that yeah, i would probably go back maybe to like the previous year 2019 because that's where i started to get active on twitter and um i was basically using it to promote my art but i was also like commenting on like the the crazy things that were even going on back then it wasn't until when was it kind of like February, March of 2020, where all of a sudden the, I felt like the media had gone from, it's, they, they weren't really paying attention to it, to, oh, we're going to have to follow China and then Italy. And then it was like, now we have to lock down. And it was that moment where I thought, this is a lot more sinister than what we were kind of like thinking it was back in January, which was like nothing too, too bad. And it kind of, from that, from the moment we locked down, I just kind of like knew that things won't be the same for quite a long time. Yeah. So it sounds like you were quite early on clocking onto it because for myself, I actually didn't really figure out that there was anything amiss until around April. My kind of moment of starting to really question things was around about the time when kind of mandatory masks were introduced way after the peak and things seemed to be and and the conversation started to shift towards vaccines long before a vaccine was ever uh, found um, or or I presume it was in development but um, long before we ever knew that there would be a successful vaccine whether or not you believe that we do have a successful one is a different question but um it sounds like you were pretty early onto that. So what was it um, about what you saw with the lockdowns happening in Italy that raised questions in your mind? That's my uh, conspiracy theorist (laughs) nature. Um, And that just goes back to, I've I've always been kind of uh, like distrustful of the uh, narrative anyway. But it's always come in sort of different sort of like levels. So sometimes some early on in life, I kind of like, I didn't know much. So it's just kind of like, I didn't really accept the way things were. I then kind of realized these sort of conspiracies at 9-11 and things like this. So it's kind of like I had a moment where I kind of thought this was uh, maybe like a bioweapon. And um, I was thinking maybe the media is trying to suppress it a little bit. I didn't feel like it was covered initially, like that big. And 
eventually when it got down to things like lockdown, that's where I thought there's, there's more to this than um, meets the eye. Once you give too much power to the government, once you, once they can say to you, you can't, you can't work, like they, they literally said, you're not essential. If you literally tell, allow the government to tell you that only essential people can work, then to me that doesn't uh, sit right. And I don't think that's sat right for a lot of people because you're kind of allowing the government to dictate when and why you, you can work. You know, you, you're, it, it's essential for everybody to work. So for me, that, that was kind of, as soon as we locked down, I was like, this is not what it, what it seems. I thought, initially I thought uh, Boris was going to go the other way because he was talking about herd immunity, but then he quickly backtracked on that. And uh, a couple of days later, we were following along with Italy and China. Yeah, and the interesting thing is when they say things like um, essential workers only, I'm surprised that most people don't recognise that this sounds incredibly communist. I mean, you know, the, the whole point of a free market economy is that the government doesn't get to decide what's essential and what's not essential, that the flow of goods and services is based upon demand. And if you are someone who is working in a restaurant or someone who is working in a hotel or someone who's an artist or, you know, someone who works in IT or media or whatever it might be, none of these things were considered essential, but actually they are completely interconnected to the rest of the economy. And the idea that the government can come in and say, well, we've decided and determined that only these things are essential, that seems inc like an incredibly dangerous idea, which was suddenly invited as a good idea or a reasonable idea uh, into Western societies where previously it wasn't. Yeah. And it, even from back then, they knew that it was a uh, relatively high survival rate. So it was, we were setting a low, a low bar, really, for what we <laughs> would completely uh, stop society for. That was my kind of feeling, not anyway. Yeah, and in those early days, I remember that there was, there was talk, actually, about um, the Oxford models, which were completely contradicting um, the models which were put out by the likes of Neil Ferguson, and I remember when I actually arrived back in the UK, because I'd been in Australia before this, and I arrived back in the UK and I remember in the car um, on the way back up um, to the north of England, it came on the radio and they were saying that these uh, Oxford epidemiologists had done a study which said that, you know, the fatality rate was uh, far less than what was being told to us and that the uh, infectiousness was lower and all of these other things. But the interesting thing is I hardly heard anything after this. It seemed like there was, the, the truth was kind of still able to be found and was still being reported on relatively fairly, uh, even in kind of February and March. But something happened for me after March, at which point anyone who wasn't on board with lockdowns and masks and the whole idea that this was a deadly, deadly pandemic, the likes of which only happened, you know, maybe once in a century, um, that this was what we were experiencing. And it seemed like all of the other dissenting voices were just completely extinguished after March. Yeah. Yeah. And, you, you know, you only had to listen to um, people like Bill Gates and you knew that this wasn't going to be something that was done in three weeks. We were told three weeks to flatten the curve. I think in America they had 14 days to slow the spread or, or whatever it was. And uh, Bill Gates was saying normal won't return until we have the vaccines. He was talking about the uh, health passports and stuff like that very early on. So it was the information was out there to see where this was going. But people were still kind of like, well, if we just do this, then that'll be fine. But just three weeks, we close for three weeks and we'll be back. And, and that's obviously still not the way it's going. So no matter how much people comply, it's still it's just going to go. Now we're on boosters, and it's third booster, fourth booster. Where does it end? Yeah, and you know, again, reversing back to this time um, directly after the lockdowns, it seemed to immediately the conversation just went straight into vaccines very very quickly. And anyone who 
understood anything about vaccines would know there's never been a coronavirus a vaccine for a coronavirus before and there certainly hadn't been a vaccine developed in the kind of time they were talking about when they were saying oh well we need a vaccine until we can go back to normal i mean were they going to wait 10 years like it would normally take to develop a vaccine obviously not they were talking about six months or one year um to develop a vaccine which was pretty much unheard of so this all sounded very very odd and i was just incredibly surprised that people seemed to just be okay with this narrative which seemed completely bizarre from what we know about infectious diseases of the past yeah it, you know for, for me from from day one just because uh, i've uh, followed these kind of conspiracies for probably just over 10, ten years and uh you know, I just thought, there's no way I'm taking what they're, they're going to give us for this. There's there's no way. And, and I was talking about that in like March and April. To me, I just, I saw where they were going with it. And so, so did a lot of people. Um, I know people have caught on uh, later down the line and that's great. But I just think our biggest mistake was ever allowing, it's, it's companies really that, it's not so much like the people because the employees don't really have uh, much choice in it if the if the employer decides to, to close the business. I mean, what can they do? For me, it was like the, just everybody just seemed, yeah, okay, that's what we've got to do. I came across a letter the other day as well, actually. It was the letter that they sent out from uh, the government saying that we've got to, you know, do everything that we can do with it we have to close the economy and whatever it, it had said in it and you know it just made me think back to that time with the company's compliance and things like this you're talking about like some of these companies uh, like multi-billion uh, pounds companies like global companies that were happy to sacrifice at least three weeks worth of revenue which is not a small amount of money for them so it just seemed odd to me. It just seemed, it seemed very strange that there wasn't really any kickback. So, it, interestingly, I also, several years ago, became quite interested in, I get yeah, I guess conspiracies is the right word, but for me it was in particular 9-11. That was uh, the thing that didn't make sense to me, that I felt like the narrative that we were being told about it was completely unbelievable. I didn't necessarily agree with some of the conspiracies on the extreme end but i certainly thought that the official narrative we were being told was absolutely crazy and then when the commission report was kind of censored with these pages linking what we now know was linking to the saudi involvement that kind of vindicated a lot of my earlier beliefs about it but i kind of strayed away from a lot of that kind of thinking after 9 11 i i kind of i i, I don't know why i guess i just became interested in different things, or perhaps I saw the kind of failure of that 9-11 truth movement to really, really to have any kind of real impact. Yeah. And uh, I became in, and I became interested in other things. I guess I never completely ditched my activism or my interest um, and my desire for a better world and for better politics, etc. But I certainly moved away from the kind of conspiracy side of things. But now I kind of feel like I'm coming back to a lot of it um, because of the people who have recognized what's going on in the coronavirus situation seem to have kind of continued along a path which I guess I kind of moved away from. Didn't It wasn't that I necessarily didn't believe anything uh, or didn't believe there were further things to be investigated. I just moved away from them for whatever reason. You were obviously quite hyper aware to what was going on because you had obviously continued in that path of distrust and i'm interested to know what is it that you see that we're moving towards or that the kind of powers that be the entrenched powers the establishment is trying to push us into what's the world they want to create for us That's a good question um i don't claim to be like a uh, an, an expert it's just when when it came to 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 us locking down it was all of a sudden it was like damn every single conspiracy theory well, uh, it's not every single, but you know, they, uh, some of the most popular conspiracy theories, they're all about to come true here. And as we've seen this over the past two years, the conspiracy theorists have been more right than, uh, 
the media have have been on it. So where we're going, I I think I, I'm not sure if I really subscribe so much to not so much like the jabs are like a depopulation tool. It's possible, but, but I just kind of think this is a primer for something else. It's getting us to accept um, controlled movement. It's, it, I think people are watching, uh, like uh, psychologists are uh, kind of monitoring how, how we react. If you look at the Rockefeller document from 2010, which they now said today is a complete conspiracy theory. With that, they outlined like different responses. And if you look around the world right now, different countries are doing different uh, levels of like authoritarian authoritarianism. So I think they're trying they're trying to get like a uh, a hold on humanity. Um, the end goal, like I, I don't know, we can only kind of guess what the actual like end goal is, but it definitely is about control and possibly depopulation. But I can't I can't be like completely um, sure about that. In a sense, I almost feel like those people who believe that there's some depopulation um, motive going on, and those who believe that there's a control motive going on both of those could come from the same place, right? Because the way that I see it, um, that those who are saying, ah, well, it's a depopulation thing. Well, why is it depopulation thing? You know, there's a lot that's tying into the kind of climate narrative and there's too many people on earth and we need to depopulate the earth by whatever it is, 90%. Mm -hmm. And then there's the people who think it's about control and you ask them why are they trying to control? And it's similar reasons. It's, well, you need to control people. You need to stop international travel. Uh, you need to stop people from, you know, eating certain things or or driving certain distances or or using certain means of transport etc but the reason for that still comes down to ah well it's the climate it's so i guess the way that i look at this and my current um theory is that it seems to be about trying to like you say craft a world according to the kind of desires the kind of utopian or many would say they are dystopian desires of a small elite and that everything that we're seeing is just to give just to give more power and control to a very tiny elite yeah so I, this, this is the mistake i think people make as well is when we talk about uh, like they or whoever the elite are i think people uh, generally feel like or they talk as if this is one entity right that is doing this because if it was then they've already won right if it was one uh group of people that control the world then they've won already they control the world so what what do they, what else do they need to to accomplish i think what we're seeing is the fact that this isn't one entity i think there's think of it like game of thrones there's many different uh families or you know like alliances they're all trying to established herself as the king or the ruling class and you know i don't i don't think it's one like family or one entity at the top i think we have different people fighting for positions of power um because otherwise if the if they already ruled everything then they could get away with whatever they want to do which i don't think is the case i don't think we're seeing that so much I was listening to a podcast the other day and I wish I could remember which podcast it was because I'd love to recommend it here. But someone was um, being interviewed and they essentially said, you know, we've had these rules of the, pa of the past. Um, people like um, Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan and, uh, you know, the leaders of empires like the Ottoman Empire. And you could put people like Hitler and Stalin and Mao into these categories. And for some reason, everyone seems to assume that these are just foregone historical figures and that now there's no human propensity for worldwide domination. And anyone who thinks that there is, is just a complete conspiracy theorist. And I just think that that's just a complete denial of history and an inability, an inability to learn from history to deny that anybody would be vying for power in the world. And I kind of agree with you that there's probably an unholy alliance between several groups that all have some mutual interests 
in this in this kind of i guess this this power struggle that we're seeing right now yeah but it seems undeniable to me that there would be forces in the world that would want to dominate because there always has been and there probably always will be that's it and i don't you know they might be moving in the same direction but they're they're they have like different ways of going about it which is what we're seeing like around the world but it is things like they explain explain if if they controlled everything explain brexit explain like trump and things like this if you always kind of think well it's because that's they wanted that to happen then I, i feel like we're sort of there is no hope, is there? Because then it's like whatever they do, and I, I don't think anybody has that type of power. I'm interested to know now that you mentioned Brexit and Trump, in particular Brexit. Where did you stand on that? Leave. Okay, and what were your reasons? Um, <laughs> basically, the same reason I don't trust uh, the government right now is it, it's. Uh, we were part of a undemocratic uh, government. It didn't make sense to me that we have like a bigger government above ourselves. That we were in in that the EU is kind of seen as like a, or it was meant to. <laughs> my, my thoughts have kind of like changed a little bit now as well. Not I, I still would vote leave, but I feel like the whole thing is kind of uh, knowing what we know now. Uh, it, it really doesn't make a difference. But going into it it was kind of like that was the small kind of like globalist like agenda having many nations acting as one state that was kind of like the testing pot so i don't don't know as much as i believe in it i don't think it's worked because what they've done essentially is taken us out of that and put us right into another set of constraints you know with other things so yeah it seems like our new leaders are the WHO, the World Economic Forum, the UN. I mean, we just exactly as you say, we're right, we're now just thrust directly into another um kind of organization which nobody voted for, which we're being bossed around in and told, um, you have to behave like this. Did you ever hear of the World Economic Forum before last year? I did actually hear of it, yeah, but I Like I think many people, I thought that this was some kind of really futurist, progressive kind of organization that was, you know, all about helping us to solve problems like climate change and helping us to, you know, I was very, very blue-pilled on the WEF before last year. I'd never heard of it until... Oh, you hadn't? No, I maybe got to sort of like August. People kept uh, messaging me on Twitter and like, Comment on my, my thing and said, oh, this is like a great reset and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, like, don't they just mean like the new world order? That's good because to me, it's exactly the same thing. I was just kind of like, right, okay, there must be like a, <laughs> a new word for like the new world order. It wasn't until I'd seen the video where they're talking about, oh, you're alone, and nothing, and you'll be happy, and all this kind of like stoking shit. And it's, that's where I thought, oh, okay, I'll look into this. And it's like, yeah, it's. It is exactly, it's what people talk when they talk about the New World Order, it's kind of that is exactly what that organisation is. Yeah. What I find interesting, going back to the idea of these kind of um, utopias, uh, you know, I sometimes imagine that these um, utopians of the past, I mean, someone wouldn't necessarily refer to someone like Hitler as a utopian, but I, I think that according to any definition, that was what he was vying to be. We all agree that it was not a utopia, but in his mind, he wanted to create a p- pure society, um, you know, where the Aryan race was the master race and the unclean were ridden from society, etc. And I sometimes wonder, well, what would a utopian society look like today, according to someone's vision? And it seems to me like the WEF and uh, some of these other technocratic organizations and individuals, their idea of a utopia appears to be some kind of technocratic utopia based upon AI and, um, you know, clean energy and at any cost, you know, very similar to the kind of coronavirus idea. It's like an eradication of all disease, an eradication of um, anything that's, that's unclean, 
um, everything must be pure and no matter what human cost is, no matter what economic cost is, it's like we have to have this society where everyone's got self-driving cars and is using QR codes for everything. And I genuinely believe that these people think that this is a utopia, but it's according to their own incredibly narrow views and they're just so arrogant that they think, ah, well, of course society has to live by our utopia, but in reality, people are complex and we don't want to live under these systems as prescribed by these um, utopianist kind of technocratic maniacs. <laughs> yeah, I think you, you um, nailed it there with the people are com- complex because what they're doing is essentially saying, well, you all have the same needs and we've got a way to, to solve it. That, that's the way they sell it anyway. I really don't think they like give a shit about us. It's more about their own... If you've got, and I don't even think I believe that the the actual population of the globe is like nearly eight billion people. If you were, if we just go by their figures, they say eight billion people, and they need to control eight billion people against the let's say one percent, right? I mean, they're just completely outnumbered. And if they're kind of expecting like an uprising of some sort, or you know, some sort of maybe tragedy in the future that might kind of jeopardize their uh, wealth or assets at least, then they want to kind of get a grip and make sure that people are put in their place before these things happen, you know? Yeah, which brings me on to another um, idea that I have, which is that I I think that a lot of this has to do with the collapse of fiat money, the the impending collapse of fiat money, and that they see the writing on the wall and they need to create a kind of society whereby we are essentially completely restricted from having any kind of uprising against um, the elites. And I, I, we're using words like elite, and I don't necessarily like to use those words because these people aren't elite through through merit. They're elite through fiat. You know, they've they just appointed themselves and they have access to the money printer and therefore, you know, they are the elites. You know, they are the kind of, the people who just suck from society and don't create any value. So I don't particularly like using that word, but for the sake of conversation, um, it's useful. Yeah. But it seems to me that these people recognize that there is a collapse coming. And I totally agree with what you just said there. I think that fiat money is the impending collapse and they are preparing themselves for that by ensuring that they have enough controls over us that they can just turn the dials from their kind of places upon high. And if you decide to... Uh, much like in China, you know, this is obviously sounds conspiratorial, but it's not untried. You know, we have the example in China where they have created a society which is almost impossible for a revolution to happen because if you try to start a protest in China, your social credit score gets eradicated. The government, you know, they're tracking you, your your face, you know, um, they know who you're in contact with and you will just end up disappearing. And it seems like they're trying to create the same world in the West because perhaps they are afraid that um, we have revolutions incoming in the West as well. I think we're seeing it right now in a few countries. Um, is it Italy, Netherlands? I think they were having... Where was the place that was getting really uh, violent? That was Netherlands. That was Netherlands, yeah. So when they're saying things like forced mandatory uh, vaccination, you just kind of... You think there's there's absolutely no sense in having like a blanket form of treatment for something, something that doesn't actually protect you anyway. They can still transmit and all this kind of stuff. Right, but so uh, more, my feelings... Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say there has to be like another level to this thing. This is obviously what we all kind of, um, kind of think about, like what, what else is it about? The only logical thing for me is you get people hooked into a system. Now, I did say kind of like a couple, a couple of days ago, I think I put a tweet out and I said, uh, what happens if people don't take the boosters? I, I don't know what happens, but um, it's just something that I think people haven't thought about too much. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. Obviously, I have no proof of that, but it's it's weird that they would kind of have this, you need to 
keep on top of your boosters. Eventually, people are going to get to the bottom. I don't want to keep taking these boosters. They don't want to have it every six months. So they need coercion. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. Yeah, that's, that's entirely possible. This is the thing, I'm, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, and I, ca- I cannot uh, speak on these things with any sort of uh, authority. It's just, for, for me, it's just it's a thought worth pondering, you know? Like, what happens if you don't take the boosters now? Right, and one of the problems with this is that now that they are saying, well, if you don't take a vaccine every six months, you become unvaccinated. Yeah. Well, now they've just created a situation by which everyone who doesn't take the booster now becomes considered unvaccinated. And now all of the statistics will say, well, these people are un- all unvaccinated and there's a pandemic of the unvaccinated. But what it actually is, is people who have taken the vaccine but haven't taken the latest booster they're now con- considered unvaccinated so you now have a situation where you can't actually identify fully unvaccinated from people who have had a series of vaccines but simply haven't taken the latest booster and you could easily imagine a scenario where the figures are essentially completely biased and skewed in favor of saying oh well look the vaccine protects but actually it's just the booster protects the latest um barium mm-hmm. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. And again, I'm not a doctor either, and this is also conjecture on my part, but it seems to me that we could see something like this going forward, and very likely will do, actually. Um, It seems to me that I, I don't actually see how that can't be the case, given that the booster situation is here and it's at our doorstep. I don't see a situation whereby those people who don't take the latest booster are not now going to enter the unvaccinated figures and it's going to be impossible to actually tell. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. Yeah, that's a good point. The other thing as well, I've seen people saying that there's people with two jabs. Now, if they don't take the third jab, their class is unvaccinated. So now it's the unvaccinated that is they're gonna if they go to hospital, it's because they're unvaccinated. At least they're not gonna report on the fact that they've had two jabs because they haven't had the third. You know, it's kind of like this these manipulation of the uh, figures and facts of where, where we really are. This is the other thing that is not actually um, maybe trust anything as well. These the, a lot of the data was actually pretty easy to debunk, like quite early on as well. Mm-hmm. with cases and deaths because you could just easily go onto the NHS website and see and they're reporting deaths and they were going back like weeks maybe in, even like a month but they were collected to make it look like it was uh, say like a thousand deaths in a day but that was actually processed deaths yeah and this kind of skewing of data and of definitions as well just seems to be happening consistently. I mean, first of all, we had the very fact that you're considering someone a case who has had a positive test, who has no symptoms. I mean, I don't recall any other time that we've treated illness like this where you're not actually ill and you're considered a case for something because you've had a swab put down your throat at a higher cycle threshold that we're told is even useful to tell you whether you have an illness at all and they're being considered as a case and then we have the situation of the vaccines which this section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines for the full uncensored version of this conversation please check the description for links to censorship free platforms used to be the case that if it doesn't provide immunity it's not a vaccine um Well, now we just change the definition of a vaccine and say, well, it doesn't have to provide immunity. Uh, You know, it just has to reduce your symptoms, which technically means that anything can be a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Technically means that other therapeutics can be a vaccine. I mean, paracetamol could be a vaccine, according to that definition. And now it seems that the latest um, changing of a definition is the very definition of being vaccinated. Now it's, well, you have to have had all of your boosters up to date Uh, And if you're not, then you're unvaccinated. So we're now changing definitions once again 
Um, and it just seems like there's no meaning anymore. We've, we've lost all meaning. And I guess maybe this is the sign of a, the end times of a civilization, which is just that you cannot assess truth because definitions are being changed to fit the narrative rather than us having any basis for truth whatsoever to assess these things. We can't really assess truth under the way that we're doing things because we're constantly shifting sand under our feet. Yeah, so, and this is kind of, I just want to touch on the point that they, uh, I, was, I, was just about to, I was just about to say they killed him, but uh, <laughs> that's my <laughs> conspiracy theory person uh, talking about. With that, but uh, Carrie Mullis, mm -hmm. the inventor of the PCR test, hated Fauci and even said that it's not, you can't use it for viruses. You know, you have to, it, it can pick up anything. It'll tell you that you, you could have anything. If you're looking for it, you'll find it. And uh, it, I just find it very, what, what a coincidence. This, this is like two years of coincidences, you know, and uh, we're meant to these off as coincidence the the media are kind of in playing catch up to what's the word i'm looking for uh debunk the 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 conspiracy here is basically they're, they're playing catch up or something because now they're saying that this rockefeller document isn't a sort of like playbook on what's happening even though there is instances that there is what is that document it, it was a document that they released in, I can't remember the name of it but it's done by the Rockefellers in 2010 was it Operation Lockstep or something like that Operation Lockstep was one part of it it wasn't the whole document so there was um, Lockstep was a lot of what you saw over here I can't quite remember the exact details but Lockstep was just one part of it the other parts were kind of a nation that didn't do anything maybe Sweden or you know some places and then there was other places that went all out maybe that could be australia you know mm -hmm. so that that's what seems like strange to me is if you're trying to if the media is trying to debunk this now it's like if you were genuine in kind of trying to get to the to the facts of things how come this document outlines like some of the ways that places have reacted now on its own it's not proof of anything. But for me, like I was saying about Carrie Mullis, he's died like literally in August 2019. Then they had the COVID-19, uh, what was the one for the Bill and Melinda Gates? Event 201. Event 201, yeah. Yeah. And this happened literally like a month before everything went crazy in 2020. So this was, that was at the end of 2019. Yeah. And then we would just said, we, there's countless coincidences that have happened over the past two years. I agree. And I think that people are slowly starting to wake up to this. But, you know, it's, I certainly feel like I've got to the point where, you know, I used to not particularly talk um, about my theories on some of the darker parts of the world. I would generally just kind of do my thing and keep my head down. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's definitely getting to the point where people have to speak up and people have to actually start acting upon what is becoming very, very clear and recognizing that what we're being told is not the case and staying silent and just complying is not going to get us out of this situation. And um, I definitely appreciate everything that you're doing on Twitter because, you know, you're a very... Um, public person and you just put your thoughts out there and um, you know you're just uh, very out there and honest and uh, I think that's always great I really enjoy like seeing your tweets and stuff Thank you. and similarly with your work uh, your artwork um, to me it has a kind of political um, edge to it which I think years to come <laughs> um, people will look at artwork like the kind of thing that you're doing and saying wow there's a real kind of profound message there so I, I wonder if you can just talk about your work for a couple of minutes and um you know i guess the kind of ideas that are going through your mind when you're creating these um pieces of art yes yeah, so my kind of journey as an artist on twitter because i never would have thought of using twitter to promote my art uh, ever i used to use instagram and share pieces on there so my trailer thought was i was making these art pieces um kind of 2016 to 2018 and 
I was kind of feeling like at, at that time I was kind of, you would say, a Trump supporter. I was also voting for Brexit. And I was kind of feeling like I'm putting this stuff out, but it wasn't a true reflection of me. And I knew how kind of polarizing these things as well. So my kind of thought was I need to align my artwork with my myself and kind of like my not necessarily political beliefs because I think this all goes beyond kind of just politics, but to represent me. My, like, I don't want to say fear, but if somebody bought a piece for me and they didn't know like really who I was, I was just like a kind of like an anonymous figure on the internet. If they would kind of like then see, oh, you support Trump, does that mean you're you're this? Oh, you voted for Brexit. Does this mean that you think this or 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 that? I didn't want to have that kind of um I guess you call it a bad feeling between like these things. So I thought if I kind of if I'm honest about what it is I believe in, then the, it would attract the like minded people to people that are happy to support me and uh buy my stuff. Because I've had people that had bought stuff for me early on that then and they, they were like people that I know but then when I've become more uh, vocal about things they were kind of like not too happy about about that and they would speak to me about it but it, it would kind of like make me feel you know if somebody who's buying something for me uh, maybe they would regret that decision and I don't want anybody to, to feel that when they kind of get a piece from me or, you know, if they're supporting me in some way, I want them to be, feel like they they know like who they're buying from, you know? That was where I, I kind of thought about it a lot. I was like, I want to start painting the people that kind of speak to me, that have like good messages that I want to promote. And I wasn't seeing like, people do that kind of art. So I thought about it for a little bit and then uh, sort of, I think it was around May of 2019. I thought I'd had the idea for a while, but I'm going to paint Flecus. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Flecus Talks. He was going out to these um, protests in the US and speaking to people that didn't like Trump. And you know, I just found this whole thing like really interesting, the way that things are becoming so polarized. So I thought, I'd really like to paint him. So I painted him. He kind of, kind of uh, saw the picture, and I kind of got a little bit of attention off of that. Then I did the Zubu piece. Um, got quite a lot of attention off of that, and then um, uh, ended up getting the painting to him. And yeah, from there I just continued to just paint people that were kind of, you know, interesting to me people that aligns with my values yeah totally and i've got this uh piece of artwork from you right behind me right now which is a, a face of a wolf which i absolutely love it and um i don't think i'll be re regretting that anytime soon it's awesome <laughs> <laughs> yeah no thank you um it, it's a uh, it's a good piece um and, and this is exactly the kind of thing because we got to know each other through the fact that we kind of share some kind of uh beliefs in some in some ways um you know through the whole uh covid stuff and that's exactly what, like i can be honest about what i say and i know that somebody buying from me isn't going to later find out oh like that guy he uh doesn't believe this but I believe so uh, it's more like our beliefs will align and I'll find the people that are kind of happy to support me and I think that's kind of like what people need to do rather than complain about the media that is out there find the people that do align with your your beliefs and support them in some way doesn't that even have to be buying things you have to spend money you just help them get the exposure yeah totally agree we've got to stay authentic to ourselves 
and also support other people who are kind of sharing in our worldview and our philosophy because if we're going to get this kind of um countercultural movement off the ground then you know we need to look to each other and support each other and i think that's going to just accelerate things and yeah it's it's an important kind of stepping stone in what i see as probably at least a decade towards really fighting back against the um legacy system and you know supporting each each other's endeavors who are within this community is an integral part of that yeah it's about it's about balance balance of things out because I, I i wouldn't want to go like too far in one direction because then you can kind of get into trouble by the space being taken up by too much things somewhere there needs to be kind of like this balance of people can represent their ideas and it's up to people to decide which are the best ideas 100 percent. because I, this is the thing i've been thinking a lot about a lot lately is that culture is kind of swayed by the uh tv music uh even artists and we're seeing it with people like bryson gray knocking adele off of the itunes chart and things like this when people get behind like these people like we have the power to shift culture yeah yeah it's not all about like oh it's it's the people like to say are oh, the artists the, the the actors or um the people making the shows like netflix or whoever it is they're there to blame but we can actually change like what we see in here because it's all uh, down from what people are exposed to. And if you watch a movie, it's pushing an agenda. You listen to a song, it's pushing the same agenda. You go on YouTube, the YouTube is pushing the same agenda. Uh, eventually, some people that are more impressionable, maybe younger people, start to think this is, well, it starts to, um, kind of, I want to say brainwash them, essentially, but um, get them into the, these kind of like things. You see with the activists and things like now, it's just, it's pretty crazy the way a lot of people think. But we have the power to support the people that align with our values, right? So we can't just sit there and complain and say, oh, Netflix is making, uh, uh, what was that show? The kids like dancing. Oh, cute cuties or something. That's it, yeah. And uh, but on the other side of things, like there's people that make shows that are not about that. It's about getting these people into positions where they change, like the landscape of media, basically. Because when you're exposing people to to the messages, it's not my. I don't want people to think exactly like me. I just want people to to think basically. So if we have, we need to balance these things. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, and I, I think that that is happening, especially one of the interesting things I've seen recently is when Joe Rogan kind of took on CNN with what they were saying about ivermectin. Yeah. And he really took them to task and he just destroyed these guys. I mean, it was just so obvious to everyone watching um, that this whole narrative they put out about ivermectin being a horse dewormer and, um, you know, making out that it wasn't fit for human use when it's been used for a long time for human use and it's fully approved. And I think it won an award. Maybe it was the Nobel Prize or something. I mean, it was, you know, whether or not you believe it's used for coronavirus is perfectly fit for human consumption and is used for a variety of ailments. So I think that we are seeing things shift. And I think that at the moment there is a kind of veneer that the legacy media is powerful but i think it's losing power by the day and i think that it's a lot of um marketing or Mm -hmm. it's a lot of show and not actually much to back it up because as far as i'm concerned not that many people are really tuning into it i do think that the narrative is shifting and the power is shifting to alternative sources and um you know whether that's joe rogan or um even what we're seeing with for instance, Odyssey and these other platforms which are taking on YouTube, I really do feel like there is a shift of power happening now and people, um, as you say, need to support each other and we can hopefully kind of grow this movement through 
um, culture as well as everything that people are doing on the political side of things we can shift it from so many different angles and we just need to support each other and help this kind of countercultural movement to come into its full fruition yeah so somebody uh i think it might have been even on i don't know if it was on joe rogan's podcast but somebody had said this um no i think it was on joe rogan's podcast actually this guy said that what's happening right now a lot of people say it's like a pendulum, right? So it swings one way and then it swings back the other. But he said, no, it's, it's like a wrecking ball because right now it, it will swing through and then on its way back, it just destroys everything. And I think that's what we're seeing like, with, with a lot of these um, movements uh, that people like to call progressive, but it's actually just about tearing people down. Yeah. So on that note, where do you think things are going from here um tell us about what we can be doing to help to build a better future on an individual level uh, that's a big question i think uh people need to establish within their self what they what they see as like freedom right because the way i see it is I should be able to make choices about my own life. And I'm, I'm, I'm even kind of starting to, to doubt kind of like democracy. And that, that's through listening to people like Michael Mannis, who's like a anarchist. And he said that democracy is pretty useless because you have to, uh, I think if you vote one way and your neighbours vote another way, you have to live with, their idea of what's good for you so we need to kind of establish because i just think while we're at it now uh, the government's basically completely uh, corrupt the whole idea of ever voting again is just i just don't ever see the point in it ever again to be honest with it i think democracy's done we have to try and think about how we can have individual freedom without imposing uh, freedom on somebody else like my, my way of living on any, on anybody else's uh, that's kind of like a it's maybe not very helpful but I think if everybody kind of thinks about that you can kind of see how this section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines for the full uncensored version of this conversation please check the description for links to censorship free platforms and somebody wants to do to do one thing, it shouldn't affect the other. But so long as you're not hurting somebody, yeah, it should have no no bearing on the other person's life. Yeah, I I agree with a lot of what you say. I think that um, I I agree with what you're saying about democracy, and I, I I definitely think that we have to find a new way forward that doesn't rely on the old systems of control. So, anyway, this has been such a great conversation. I would love to keep going, but uh, we have to wrap this up at some point. Um, just tell people where they can get hold of you and uh, any last words that you have. Yeah. Uh, so my website is adamprinsondesigns.com. That's where you see my artwork, T-shirts and prints. But I'm mostly active on Twitter. That's uh, at Adam Brimson. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Cool. Well, thanks so much for the chat and I'll see you on Twitter and hopefully we can have another conversation down the line. Awesome. Thank you for having me.